This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you on this sunny afternoon in the Mara Triangle where we are ensconced in this large herd of elephants. My name is Steve Falkenbridge and this is Wild Wonderland. Absolutely magnificent. This is happening, folks. This is 100% live. Here we are. We're watching the migration story unfold. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, that was close. You can't possibly script something like this. Well, welcome to the most dramatic scene that is unfolding. We've just had a few wildebeest jump into the water and there's a young one that is trying to get away from a bunch of crocodiles that have got it by the legs. It is really an incredible spectacle to see. This is a very, very, very big welcome to Wild Wonderland CGTN's live show. My name is Tristan on camera. I've got David and we are coming to you live from a three epic location. Tanzania's Serengeti National Park, Kenya's Masai Mara, and South Africa's Sabi Sands. And the best part about all of this and the excitement of what's about to happen, and hopefully we'll get more wildebeest going over, is that this is going to be live to you and that means you can interact with us and you can do so using hashtag CGTNWild or hashtag Wild Wonderland. Now that poor baby is caught in a very bad place. There's about four crocodiles around it at the moment and its chances of survival, I would imagine, are almost zero. And fortunately, when there's that many crocodiles, and they've got a hold, a firm hold like they do at the moment, I doubt that it's going to be able to escape and it's right in the middle of the river which means that its chances of getting out from there is probably very slim. You can actually see some more crocs are coming. Now there's a whole bunch of other wildebeest that are building up to the left and hopefully they're going to come across. Unfortunately though, when you're right on the edge of the water like this, they tend not to cross. And so what we need to do is just back up a little bit and try and just move away slightly to allow them to then start getting the confidence to go over. It really is one of those things. Wildebeest are quite skitzy and they don't really like it when there's lots of cars right up on the bank. And so we're gonna have to let them have a bit of space if we're gonna have any chance. Now, the migration is one of the most epic phenomena on earth and take a look just how crazy it can be. The red oat grass plains of the Mara Serengeti sway in anticipation. In February, around 400,000 wildebeest are born on the short grass of the Serengeti's southern plains. Just half an hour, the calves have found their feet. And one of nature's greatest journeys begins. From the southern plains, more than a million animals move northwest into the Serengeti's western corridor, massing on the banks of the Grumeti River. As the rut ends, the herds gallop north once more. Eventually, two million grazers arrive to feast on the abundance of the Masai Mara. It begins with the trickle of the zebra vanguard, enjoying the undisturbed long grass plains making the first crossings of the turbulent Mara River. Many fall to the rapids and the crocodiles. And then comes the main body of the migration, the thundering herds of white-bearded Gnu, leading songs of chaos in search of green pasture. The herds know the danger, but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. Not all will make it. For those that do, hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. For survivors, rich red oat grass is the reward. Before it's time to cross the river again, as nature's greatest herd follows the life-giving storms and verdant plains of the Mara Serengeti for nourishment. exciting time of the year to be in East Africa. We've got some vultures there that are eating a wildebeest we think killed by the salt lick pride last night. My name is James Hendry. On camera we have got enormous James who despite the heat out here in Kenya still has his gloves on. Let's go back and have a quick look over there. We've had jackals in here and we're pretty sure that the salt lick pride is about to arrive 
at the Egyptian goose pan, where we've seen them over the last few evenings, and we're hoping that that will be the case, and that they will hunt these massive herds sitting all around us here. We've got a number of different vulture species there. The Rupel's griffins are the ones dominating there at the moment, and just to the right of that, we've got a white-backed vulture. There are about five species here. While I enjoy these vultures, let's go down to South Africa, where the action-packed western woodlands of the Kruger National Park are in full swing. Welcome to the wild wonderland that is South Africa. We have just watched a young, young leopardess almost miss, I think, a diker. Crazy! My name is Lauren and I do have Seb on camera and over here somewhere we have about a 20 month old leopardess known as Klalamba. It's a bit of a mouthful. She is here, we've been sitting with her some time, but she's disappeared from our clutches at the minute. But we are going to try and loop around the thicket a little bit and of course find her. She just darted after something. So hopefully she might be able to catch her dinner and we of course can sit and watch her. We've shown you many leopards out here in South Africa and this is possibly the youngest female that we will see. Just trying to think which way to go to get her. I'm gonna go through here. She's very, very small, very, very petite. And her name actually means mischievous, believe it or not. And that's exactly what she's showing she is today. Okay, let's see if we can just see her up ahead. There is another vehicle out today also looking for her. So I do apologize if you saw any houses or lodges. There are some around here and we're actually just driving past at the moment. There is another vehicle ahead and we're both of course looking for our beautiful spotty leopardess. They're not easy to find, very, very camouflage. And of course it seems like she was very hungry. She went this way, so I'm just gonna poke my nose in a little bit further. Alrighty, while we try and get a view of our beautiful Tlalamba, we're going to send you guys back up to Tristan. Well, she is absolutely magnificent, little Tlalamba. And I must admit, I do miss her after not seeing her for the last three weeks. I have missed her a lot. Now, you'll see that the wildebeest are still sort of hanging around at this stage. There's no certain movement as to which way they're going, but this is often what happens is you have to be very, very patient at these crossings because they'll come down and then they'll build a little bit, then they'll go back and then they'll come. And so we're just trying to give them a little bit of space. You'll notice that there are a few cars around. Obviously, this is a tourist area, and so there's a number of vehicles that have come to see this incredible spectacle. So what we're doing at the moment is we're just being patient. We've just reversed back away from the river edge at the moment, and we're hoping that these wildebeest will start moving. And if they move from left to right, then they're moving towards the river. There's quite a few of them stretched over a very long line at the moment and so if one goes it will cause all of them to start running down towards the river and that crossing will then start to take place. So we just need to be patient and we need to sit tight and eventually hopefully they will go. Wildebeest are a funny animal. They'll sit like this for hours and hours and hours and then all of a sudden it just takes one to be brave enough to take the plunge and that just opens the floodgates and everybody goes. And so, you know, hopefully it will happen in the next little bit. It certainly kind of hopeful given that some have already gone over and we hope that the rest will start to go over so it's just a bit of a patience game for now in the meantime though let's send you across to david with his lines and see what they're getting up to for the afternoon well migration brings very good news especially to the lions here in the mara and when the migration leaves the mara for serengeti it's always happy for the lions jumbo jumbo everybody my name is david and on camera is bungay how are you doing bungay well we got a pair of lions here and i'm talking of a male and a female and i think this is a mating pair Many thanks for watching CGTN World Wildlife Show. And we're coming to you live from another part of the Masimara. 
Now, I'm yet to identify which male this is, but the female, I can tell you for a fact, it comes uh, from a pride of lions that we call Boda group. And you can see a bit of communication there with the tail there of the female. And looking at the bellies of these two lions, you can tell they're quite full. So the now, Lauren, you got a very good question there, and you're asking, do the predators know when the migration is coming? And looking at our predators here, Lauren, we're looking at number one, lions, what you have on your screen. We are looking at leopards, we're looking at cheetahs, we're looking at wild dogs, we're looking at hyenas. Those are so basically our our predators in this particular area. Ideally, they have an idea because there's a particular pride of lions that I follow, Lauren, called the sausage tree pride, and they have moved outside their territory, an indication that they're in the picture or they're aware that the migration is here. And what they have done, they have inched much closer to the big masses or big herds of the wild beast, of the wild beast rather, which tells you they always have an idea when the migration is coming around. So this particular pair that's mating, when they start mating sometimes, the first few days is always about what? 60, 70 times in a day? What are you up to, gentlemen? A good stretch there from the female. And in general, it's the females that will always initiate the mating. Look at how beautiful he is. And once she's ready and she's around, she'll always get close to the male and they'll be ready to mate. He's just licking himself there. And the female is just flicking her tail because of all the flies around. And both of them look to be in very good shape. All right, she just rolled over again. And maybe for now they're having a little bit of a break. So what we'll do as we wait to see if they're going to meet. Are you all? We might. Hang on, ladies and gentlemen. Speak of the devil. What a timing, ladies and gentlemen. Wasn't that wonderful? I was just about to link your way to take you to my friend on the other side of the Mara, Steve, with the elephants. Brother, let me hang on for a few seconds and see what happens and how lucky we are. I'm so excited. I need to digest that. And as I breathe out, we'll take you to elephants with Steve. Thanks, Gigi. I'm sure no one's going to forget those scenes they've just witnessed. Well, you are still here with us in the Mara Triangle with our very large herd of elephants. And if you only just started watching, you're watching the CGTN Wild Wonderland live show. And we are coming to you live from the Mara Triangle. My name is Steve Folkerbridge, and I'm joined by Jandre Gearing on camera. It is wonderful to have you with us this afternoon. And this very large herd of elephants moving behind us or in front of us at the moment through this very tall, rank grassland. You'll notice that between the elephants and us, it's almost a swamp. It's a marshy area and it gets very inundated with water here, but also produces very, very good grass. And this area we're in is right up in the north of the triangle and the herds will slowly be moving here. Uh, they're still further south and enjoying the grasslands closer to the southern areas of the Mara uh, towards Serengeti. Uh, but they will eventually get up here in their multitudes and mow all of this grass down. So for now, the elephants are enjoying the peace and quiet that comes with the lack of the migration herds. And they're also making the most of the green grass you can see around. And there's more than 50 in this herd. 
and it's made up of a number of females with their small family units. But anyway, before we go any further, let's take you down to South Africa where Lauren has caught up with the princess. I indeed have caught up with Miss Tlalamba here. Believe it or not, right through the thicket, you can just see her spotted pattern. She did have her head up, I'm afraid, but she's just put it down. And I do think this is the best view that we can probably get for you at the minute. You can see how she's nestled herself in right into those black monkey orange bushes. And it's because it's still the heat of day. It's still very, very hot here in the Kruger Park. And of course, leopards are primarily nocturnal. So who knows what these cats get up to at night time, but they're very, very active. That is generally when they tend to do most of their hunting, patrolling, scent marking, and all sorts of things. So as I mentioned earlier, Tlalamba here, little Miss Machievious, is very, very young, and she's such a joy to be around. Let's learn some more about her. Hi. In November 2017, Queen Tandi gave birth to a daughter, Princess Tlalamba. This unspeakably cute ball of fluff lived in a den for eight weeks. She spent her time playing with mum in the woodlands of Juma. And while these games are adorable to watch, they have a purpose. The bounding, climbing and stalking help develop the skills and muscles to survive in the wild. Tlalamba remains reliant on Tandi for food, comfort and protection. And for the next little while, she will continue to watch and learn from her mother, the Queen. So we've known Tlalamba obviously since about three or four days after she was born and our hearts are deeply invested in her fate. Not so much this lappet faced vulture, we haven't seen him before, I don't think we might have. He is the biggest vulture species that we get here. We get five, four most of the time. That's the biggest and he will dominate the carcass until he's had enough to eat and then he'll leave it alone. At the carcass now we've got two species, one a white-backed griffin and the other the rupel's griffin. The white-backed griffin is the one that looks like a gangster and the Rupel's griffin is the one that looks like it's got an expensive coat on and with a slightly golden tip to its beak. They're roughly the same size. The Rupel's probably slightly bigger than the white-backed and so the gangster white-backed has to stand off a little bit at the carcass. And then the other one we get is called a hooded vulture and that really is the street urchin of the vulture world. They don't dominate anything and they're the only creature I know of that will sort of willfully eat lion dung, which is the most disgusting substance on planet Earth. And sometimes we get Egyptian vultures here, but that's very rare indeed. And they've been squabbling over this carcass the whole day. Like I say, I think it was probably killed by the Salt Lake Pride yesterday evening, and I watched that particular pride kill eight wildebeests in one night once. In the space of about 40 minutes, they didn't eat one of them. And so this time of the year is the time of eating a lot and also just killing. And it's quite interesting to me, of course, that it seems that the instinct to hunt and the instinct to eat amongst the lions are not the same thing. And also, very interestingly, on these plains, this very area, about two weeks ago when we arrived, there were no wildebeest here and we couldn't find a vulture. Now, as the wildebeest have come through, so look at all those magnificent birds. There are all the herds. Let's go back into Tanzania where there are more herds hopefully heading up north into this area. Well, the wildebeest, I'm afraid, have decided to give it up for the day. I don't think there's going to be any more crossings for this afternoon because, as you can see, they are slowly trudging their way through a very dry landscape at the moment. It's almost a dejected view of these animals as their heads are down and they sort of nod their way along with dust coming off from their hooves. It's absolutely beautiful, but it looks desolate and almost sort of 
desperate in a way as they start to kind of make their way across the river as though they're disappointed that they didn't make it across this afternoon but it means that we in all likelihood will have a lot of bullbeast around the river tomorrow afternoon or morning should i say um and so we should hopefully see them building up again tomorrow maureen why are there fewer zebras in this migration uh, there's not fewer zebras um, there's still a lot of zebras around um, it's just that there are far more wildebeest and so everybody always thinks that there is equal numbers of uh, wildebeest and zebra and it's far from uh, the wildebeest numbers are over a million whereas the zebras are only around 250,000 um, within the migration sort of movements and so not huge 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 numbers like you see in um well like people believe and so while there are zebras around and <clears throat> many of them will have crossed already to the Masai Mara but there are still a lot in the northern Serengeti particularly a little bit south of where we are at the moment there's still a few nice herds that are there and often when you get these big crossings um, most of the time it's dominated by wildebeest um, zebras will be a part of it and maybe they went over we just caught the tail end of the crossing as they were crossing over it wasn't a very long one and um, maybe the zebras went up in the middle sort of section of the wildebeest it's interesting with zebras though when they cross they are not the first ones to go over generally what you find is that the wildebeest are the first ones to take the plunge and the zebras will only cross once there's a sort of swarm of wildebeest in the water it's almost as if they know that as crocodiles around if the first few that go in are normally the ones that are going to be snatched and they can then kind of hang back a little bit and then cross a little bit later so it's quite interesting to watch them and they generally go in when there's a lot of them in the water and then try and get out quite quickly and they're actually very very strong swimmers so it's quite interesting watching the difference between the two right as the last few trickle across the dusty earth let's send you back across to david with his mating lines Well, not once I have seen uh, lions waiting by the river as the wildebeest cross either Gurumet River in Serengeti National Park or the very famous the Masai Mara River in Kenya or the Mara River basically and you'll always see these lions just waiting by the side and who knows what they are able to catch. Now, just look at that vast landscape of the Masai Mara, huge areas that we only see open areas that we call the savanna and you go to our lions just here the mating pair not much they're doing at the moment but the female is just licking herself and trying to groom herself and i'm sure at any one point what she'll do she'll just have to rise turn around and walk towards uh, the female. Unlike most other animals, here the lionesses normally, once they're ready, they're the ones who make the fast move and the male is always ready to start mating. And once that's finished, they both go flat and more so the male than the female. The female is up now, she's facing a different direction, not sure she'll walk towards the male. When they just start mating the first few days, as I said earlier, the mating is always at a frequency of 60 to 72 times in a day for the first two, three days. But of course, other factors may come in play. Age, uh, the genes, the type of lions, and of course, the physical condition of the particular lion or lioness. But that is always the pace. First few days is always like 60 to 72 times in a day. And the mating may go on for anything between six to 10 days non-stop it's a very special ritual for them and more often than not what i've found out out of experience is when they're mating nothing else matters they don't even bother hunting they don't even bother mating gm thank you for your question i'll be back with you in a minute <coughs> Wow, that's the response of about 10-15 minutes since the last meeting we saw and I would think this meeting is very new and they may continue doing that every 10-15 minutes as much as it doesn't last long and my apologies GM for your question uh, got interrupted there 
by that meeting. I truly apologize, but this is how things go here. And you're asking, do lions get covered by ticks? Yes, they do get covered by ticks. And more often than not, you'll see ticks on their ears sometimes or on their bellies. So yes, GM, you're right. They get uh, covered by ticks, but not as much. In places you'll see ticks is the soft parts of the bodies, either on the bellies or just around um, the ears. It's very interesting. So the female is always more active even after mating than the male. The male tends to wear out and just goes flat and waits until the female is ready again to start mating. That has been very cool to see them mating in under 15 minutes. And as usual, as I've done before, let's go back to the elephants again with my friend Steve on the other side of the Mara. Thanks, Gigi. You're having a marvelous time down there towards the west, as are we with our huge herd of elephants that have spread out in a long line, grazing as they go. They don't stand in one spot and just overutilize. Elephant herds actually move as they feed. They move far away from water and then eventually as they get thirsty, they turn and head back in almost single file, straight back to water to drink again, and then slowly meander away again, filling their never ending bellies and uh, then go back and drink again. And amazing how such a large group of animals can move so quietly through the bush. I'd like to see 50 odd people be quieter than a group of 50 elephants moving through. It is surprising how they can sneak up on you. Beautiful padded feet. There's a couple youngsters having a bit of a push and shove. Uh, they were, sorry, they were before. Now they are just feeding so family groups made up of the oldest females with her daughters and then the young boys always on the periphery quite often for years following the herds feeling quite sort of um, amiss without the, the love and care that comes with the herds but slowly the boys will meet other groups of boys and hang out together in small bachelor herds only really moving into the breeding herds when it comes time for mating. Okay, well, we're going to send you back down to the Serengeti where Tristan has got some vultures in a tree. Indeed we do. So not far from these crossings, generally, you'll find these birds of prey as they circle around hoping for some drowned victims that they can then feed on or otherwise any predation that happens on the banks of the river they can then come down and have a really good meal but it's this time of the day where they're starting to kind of come down anyway just to try and find a roosting spot it's getting towards sunset now and so many of them are going to look for an area where they can try and sit and land and they can then be ready for tomorrow's affairs because as we start to go tomorrow if there's wildebeest close to the river like there is this evening there might be crossings early on and these guys might then benefit from it as well as the fact that at night obviously lions and hyenas are going to start trying to go after them and so they can then get to those kills first thing in the morning which you can see a beautiful view of lots of vultures in the tree right now while we carry on and look for other things let's send you across to james who's got an even prettier view as he has lions with little ones playing Look how lucky we've got. The Salt Lick Pride Cubs have come out from where they've been hiding all day. Not sure exactly where that's been, but we've got both age groups, the little baby ones and the slightly older ones. Isn't that gorgeous? They've got bored, hiding from everything today, and now they've come out to play, just as it's starting to get a little bit cooler. Now just to reiterate to you, the Salt Lake Pride's four lionesses, we think it's three and three lots of cubs. Three tiny ones, around about six to eight, well, say eight to ten weeks old, and three bigger ones of pushing sort of five months. Isn't that fantastic? And they're going to start playing now, and probably keep playing, hopefully, until it gets dark. 
don't know where the adults are. We haven't seen them yet. Remember, ask us any questions you'd like to using the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag WildWonderland on Twitter. And many of you saying, ooh and ah, at the cuteness of the sausage tree, at least not the sausage tree, the salt lick pride cubs. And you can't see it now, but they have a beautiful view down over the plains where we were with the vultures and the wonderful herds, of course, of wildebeest that will form the bulk of their dinners for the next few months, courtesy of their mothers. They won't have anything to do with catching them. They will all still be suckling. The ones, the, those ones that are jumping off the lo rocks there are most likely going to be still suckling, although they will be weaning. And then <laughs> all right, they're gonna play here in the setting sun. Let's go from a young lion to a young leopard. Yes, young Clalamba here is still lying, having a little cat nap, quite literally in amongst the thicket here. It is actually the ideal location to take a little snooze. It's in the shade, there's a nice breeze coming through, and of course she's catching up on some snooze. But I can assure you, this girl will get up at some point. We see her quite regularly hunting scrub hares, dikers, steenbok, and of course she can go for much larger animals, but a female of this size, it's very, very easy just to catch the smaller animals. She's out here alone. And of course, she may be incredibly flat right now, but I can assure you, this girl here will get up and she becomes very active. Naughty leopard cubs love exploring while their mothers are out hunting. A friendly chaff when mother reappears is sometimes met with cantankerous impatience. After a successful hunt, there is no time to waste. After a mother huntress has eaten, she will lie in the shade and supervise. It takes time to learn leopard skills, and a cub's efforts are often best described as unrefined. But practice makes perfect, and cubs use carcasses as learning sessions for choking, dragging, pouncing, Stalking and almost hoisting, all under the patient protection of a watchful mother. Now, there's some very interesting differences between leopard cubs and lion cubs in the way they grow up. Leopards, of course, grow up to be solitary, lions grow up to be social, and there's a subtle difference in the way they play. Often a leopard is on its own. Sometimes it's in a group with a sibling, very seldom with two siblings. And so sometimes they do have a sibling to play with, but not like this where there are two litters of cubs here and they're learning from each other. All of this play behavior, of course, as I was saying in that other little Tlalamba clip, has to do with uh, preparing yourself for adulthood is just the same as it is with human beings. It's developing muscles, it's developing neurological uh, connections, and it's developing social skills. But in a leopard, it's not about social skills. It's much more about developing strength and independence and learning, as you saw with Tlalamba there, to protect her kills when she eventually starts making them on her own. And hopefully you'll be able to see that she has learned those lessons, much more accomplished at hoisting kills than she was when you saw her there. These lion cubs will not have to protect their kills really from anything other than hyenas, and they'll do that with brute strength. So it can be a nerve-wracking time until they're a fully-fledged member of the pride, and if the pride's very small, especially here in the Mara, they can be chased off their kills but by hyenas, but they will have to use only brute strength to defend their kills because they are the biggest predators out here. 
and the bonds that they are forming now will be very crucial to their defense of their kills. There are the adults. You can see them just in the front there. You can see the tail flicking there. Now it would seem that the population of lions here in the Masai Mara is set to increase a little bit further. Yes, and the population will be enhanced or even get better because the migration is all over. Now, if the mating of this particular pair will be successful and that female is just rolling over, is going to conceive in her fallopian tubes, we are looking at another 100 days or so, about three months from now, we are going to see cubs, not exactly like what James have, but some cubs will be born. Now, depending whether this is a first timer, female, if it's a first timer, in general they get one cub, sometimes two. But if it's, it's an old female that has had, you know, cubs before, they'll always get about three or four cubs. Must he? Pretty good question there. And you're asking how long will they stay together? Must he? If these are freshers, I'm talking about if they're just starting mating maybe two or three days ago, they might be together for the next six or seven days, and that varies. Some lions, Masi, go up to 10 days together. What a nice roll there. So I was just looking at her mammary glands earlier, and they look pretty small. And she also looks a, a bit young of a female to me. Are you going to meet again? Wow, I couldn't ask for more. And I'm sure all of you are pretty excited by this CGTN Wild Wonderland live show coming to you all the way from the Maasai Mara of Kenya. That is under, I would say, 25 minutes. I've seen them mating three times. And I think I could be justified to say this could be at the second day or the third day of this lion's mating because that frequency, you know, is quite often. And when they just start, that's exactly what happens. And what a gorgeous male we got here. Let's look at him. And he's always going flat. Boom. Isn't that wonderful? Now, as I said, if all goes well, this female conceives another 100, 105 days, we might see a new generation of cubs, like what James Henry got on the other side. Here we are with our lions, and mum has just got up and she's lay, lie, laying on top of them and squashed them against those rocks and they gave some whining noises and now they're being affectionate with their mother, probably thinking about having a bit of a suckle, which would be nice for them. And one of them surveying the domain that will one day hopefully be his. My name is James Henry. On camera we have got enormous James. There is his enormous finger. I'll go back to our beautiful lions now. You are watching CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show and it's a huge privilege to have you here with us in Africa from three locations live on the world's biggest safari. You can hear the little noises they're making. A question from Spatz about whether or not these lions are able to protect themselves. No, they're not. They're extremely vulnerable at the moment. They are not able to protect themselves from anything bigger than they are and so they must remain hidden when the adults are not around. They'll hide here under rock overhangs, in this very thick grass, under thickets and in bushes, and sometimes even in the culverts of the road. They'll hide and stay away. And then when their parents are around, when their mothers are around, they'll waken up a little bit and start to play like this out in the open. 
and that little one is just having the most wonderful afternoon surveying the bounty of the migration and thinking probably to I think it looks like a little she thinking to herself how lucky she is to have been born a lion in the Masai Mara and she is lucky if I was a lion this is where I'd want to live especially at this time of the year and I'm sure you can just hear in the background I'm quiet for a second and just hear the background noise of all the gnooing gnoos. Let's go back down to South Africa now, where I believe our other young cat is starting to wake up. Tlalamba was deciding to wake up. We got a big almighty yawn and of course, the head has gone back down. This generally is the time when the cats and the nocturnal animals start to wake up. It is golden hour. For those of you who have joined, my name is Lauren. I do have Seb on camera, and this over here is a young leopardess known as Tlalamba. And she's very, very young, 20 months, and she's very petite and small, and she's just nestled herself into the thicket here. And of course, it's actually really not too easy to find her at all. <laughs> With that incredible camouflage that she has, you can just see her there. But of course, once the sun starts to set here and it gets a little bit cooler, the cats wake up. Cole is asking where is her mum? We actually know who her mum is and her mum is a leopardess that I had a few days ago, two days ago, called Tandy. And once the leopards reach a certain age of independence, normally around 18 months, they do separate from their mothers and they're out here on their own. So at the minute, Tlalamba here is on her own, very much fending for herself. She may bump in or interact to her mother or her other siblings or even her father out here, but she's very much on her own. She's not yet set up a territory yet but that will come very shortly she will become much more independent with a territory of her own so it seems like jamie is not too far away from me with something much less furry Oh, we are not far away at all, and while Lauren is looking at a very camouflaged leopard, we've come back to our very camouflaged and slightly uncooperative chameleon, who was beautifully out in the open, and as soon as we tried to show it to you, it decided to move further down into this apple leaf bush. Now, my name is Jamie, and behind the camera is Craig, and there's a reason that I've come back to look at this chameleon, even though we did see it yesterday afternoon, on yesterday afternoon show. It's actually very seldom that we get to see chameleons during the day, although admittedly with this chameleon's now made Craig's life incredibly difficult in terms of actually being able to see it. It's now ducked below the branches and it seems as though it's decided that it is a camera shy. But they're incredibly difficult to find during the day. At night, it's slightly different because at night, they no longer need to be this sort of bright green and disappear into the leaves because, of course, everything is, nothing is seeing in color. So they don't really need to worry about being camouflaged. So they go a sort of a gray color. So they're easier to find at night. But during the day, it is particularly difficult, which is why I'm enjoying the fact that we actually know which tree this chameleon lives on. They are territorial. So if you ever feel the need to pick up a chameleon in the wild and move it, please don't, because they're territorial and their trees are their territory and it would upset them terribly. Um, this chameleon's upset me slightly by the fact that it's moved even further down into this tree. Uh, while we wait to see if it pops out into the open again, let's go back across to James and those adorable lion cubs. And adorable mother. As I was saying, I think a few days back, lions cease being adorable at around about six months. Then they go through a little bit of an ugly stage, like we all do when we're growing up, and then they become magnificent. So they can go from adorable to magnificent in about two and a half years. The males take about six years to get to magnificent. But the little ones are just magical. 
especially if you get them making a bit of a noise. Now, it's impossible to tell if that is the mother of any of these cubs because, of course, anyone in the pride will look after the babies and suckle them. I suspect that's the mum of the smallest cubs because she's the closest to them. And I remember her being very heavy chested yesterday. She's got a very strong chest. I'm not sure where the other adults are. They could, I don't know that they're here. They'll be somewhere around, but lying in this very thick grass. She's thinking about dinner tonight. There's no question that they ate a wildebeest last night. Came back here, fat and full and happy. Spent the day lying in the grass and under the culvert here in the road for the little ones. And now they're thinking about perhaps another meal. And as I said, this pride will hunt even if they're not hungry. So if the opportunity presents itself as it gets dark, they could well hunt. Oh, that's just too sweet for words. Now something that everybody loves to see when they come to Africa is the tallest mammal in the world, and that's not me or Big James, it's a giraffe. Oh, indeed, the iconic animal of the African plains, the giraffe. And this one being the Maasai giraffe. And there on the right is a big male, and he seems to have his interests in that smaller female to the left. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that. You can just see the body language, the eye language. He is making steady movements towards her. There's a very good chance if he does catch up towards it, he will go for a bit of a sniff. She's headed towards the bush for a feed. And, well, if you're just joining us, welcome to the show. Where have you been? My name is Steve Falkenrich, joined by jean Dre Gedding on camera. And we are here loving ourselves with some Maasai giraffe. And uh, she has gone to the bush. And let's see if he's going to do what I suggested. Is he also going to eat? Oh, maybe he saw the same bush. My apologies, everybody. But you can see how well hedged that bush is. It has been manicured by countless giraffe feeding sessions. As you can see, it's growing like a hedge, not like a tree. And around it, there are almost no trees whatsoever. So the giraffe sort of ping pong between whatever trees they can find on these open plains. And some of them are quite small, bending right, right down with their very powerful neck. They use enormous amounts of muscle in their neck to bend their neck down. And they have got this very, very powerful, strong ligament that runs down the back of the neck that keeps their neck at that sort of 60 degree angle. And Pisces, you say love is in the air. Well, yes, it is indeed. Although those two are having a dinner date before anything else, which I suppose is the right way to go about things. But you can see that giraffe is walking there. It requires no energy or effort for it to hold its head up like that because of the ligament down the back of its neck attaching to its spine. And when it wants to bend its neck, it has to use all of the muscles in its neck, which are many, very, very powerful, to bend its neck all the way down, which they need to do quite regularly for drinking as well as for feeding at a variety of heights. There in the far distance, the trees indicate where the Mara River is and our giraffe enjoying some delicious leaves. We're going to send you over to James, whose Sultic pride seems to be on the move. The lioness is up. And in fact, we've seen another lioness as well. So there are at least two here of the hunting, shopping members of the pride. She's just walking up to where a very serious little cub is examining the dinner table. Much like human beings, all of these animals have got different personalities and sometimes quite difficult to tell the difference between them. But here, you can see that this cub is not interested in playing. She's only interested in looking at the herds, sussing them out. And she's, I suppose, could be likened to a scholarly 
young child who doesn't have time for silly games, only has time for thinking about much more adult topics. And that's that little cub there. The rest of them, however, have plenty of time for silly games. And they're really enjoying them, which of course they should, because they only get to enjoy these sorts of games until they're about a year old, whereupon the games tend to stop. They'll start following on the hunt, and eventually they'll make their first kills properly between 18 months and two years. Let's go back to South Africa now, where finally Tlalumba seems to be waking up. And just as predicted, golden hour is here and our beautiful leopardess is now awake. Continuously yawning, might I add. Oh, and she's on the move. Now is the perfect time. It's very predictable. You just know when the cats are going to get up, going to get active, going to start sniffing around and potentially, from what we saw earlier, she's hungry. She's most likely looking for a snack to tide her over. Now we're just going to watch exactly where she's heading. She's gone right into this bush. She's having a real sniff around. Of course, the senses of the cats are much better than the likes of ours. So their eyesight, their hearing, their sense of smell is so much beyond what we could even imagine. Who knows what she's actually smelling in there. Now she's just gone completely out of our view. Let me see if I can roll forward. Oh, she's coming, she's coming. That bush does not look very comfortable. Yes, she changed her mind, decided to not exit that way, and here she comes. Look at her. Isn't she just beautiful? Hello, Tlalamba. You see how lightly she walks on her feet there. <laughs> and she's so much smaller than the male leopard that we've been spending time with, Hosanna. They are related, of course, but she's so much smaller than her, him. And look at her tail. Leopards tend to do that with their tails. They tend to keep them up at the end with the white part, and it's like a white flag saying, peace, I come in peace to any of the other animals we're going to start alarm calling. The tail goes up, I come in peace. Doesn't always work, but that's why they do it. So we're just going to wait for another vehicle to move and see if we can get a better view of her. Be her with us. Where's she going? We're going to have to turn around a little bit. Okay, so we're going to try and navigate around this and keep up with her. And of course, we've been following this young leopardess for many years. And one of the most favourite moments was Tlalamba's first kill. Hi. Like all young cats, Princess Tlalamba was reliant on her mother's skills to feed her. But the constant demands of a growing daughter can be tiresome. Tlalamba probably first attempted hunting as soon as she emerged from her den. Termites and grasshoppers to start with. Her skills improved with her increasing strength and coordination. Her targets got bigger. In March, the months of training, failures and lessons finally paid off with a large antelope. She has since moved on to even bigger fare. This ram is one and a half times her mass. The princess's newly honed hunting skills will stand her in good stead as she asserts her independence. Amazing to have watched her develop and becoming the skilled huntress that she is, little Tlalamba. It's actually 
was one of the first to see her make a live kill and it was incredible just to watch after seeing her grow up from a tiny little ball of fluff. Anyway, you can see we're still with some wildebeest. Not a very big herd, a small grouping, but it's the most beautiful light in the Serengeti at the moment. So it was worth just stopping and having a look. And often they get a bad reputation about the fact that they are ugly animals. But in this kind of light, they really are quite beautiful. I thoroughly enjoy looking at them when there's this gold kind of coloration because their sort of shimmery coat picks up the light and it almost makes them sparkle a little bit as well as those white beards that catch the light and glow this kind of golden orange color it really is very very beautiful especially when you've got a bit of wind around as well now for those of you who have just joined us my name is tristan and we are in the serengeti in tanzania it's a wonderful place to be except for the flies that are going up my nose which is not so wonderful at all um, but it's nice to be in amongst the herds um, unfortunately at this time of the year a lot of the wildebeest have crossed north towards kenya but the nice thing about the serengeti is that you always get herds that remain behind and so there's always some wildebeest around but I don't know if you can hear when they walk, you can actually hear the grass being crunched and eaten and a few grunts and groans, it's a bit windy, so you might not. So I'll just keep quiet for you to listen. Fortunately, the, fortunately the wind has just kicked up in the last little bit. So it makes it a little bit tricky, but it's amazing when you're with these herds is you actually hear the crunching of the grass and not only from their mouths, but from their feet as well, as well as those obviously those bellows that they make as the herd moves around and everyone kind of connects with one another, especially the young ones talking to their moms. Right, we're going to head off in a sort of easterly direction close to where we saw a leopard this morning and hope that we get a bit of luck. In the meantime, though, back to James, who's having all the luck this afternoon. Our little cubs are now chatting to each other about which wildebeest they think would be the best one to eat for dinner. They look like two little kids watching a television show that they really enjoy. Totally captivated by the herds moving past them. You can just imagine the conversation they'd be having if they could talk. And there's certainly some kind of communication going on between them. No one knows exactly, but well, there's certainly some kind, and I would imagine that if they were human kids, they'd be asking their mother, look at that one, look at that one, Mum. That one looks good. It's very sweet. The others are just behind, and they're still playing against their rocks. And you can hear all the wildebeest gnawing away, frantically. Don't know what they're saying to each other. No one does. It's actually, most often when I've observed the wildebeest closely, which we seldom do because we're looking for predators a lot of the time, it's often the bulls that are chasing other bulls that are making this gnawing sound. Sometimes the youngsters, who have well weaned by now, they're not suckling anymore. Some of them will try, but they're, they're not suckling anymore. Sometimes it's the youngsters, but often it's the big bulls. Now, the major enemy, of course, of these lion cubs is the next predator along in the hierarchy, and in the Maasai Mara, they are an awesome force. Indeed, the hyena and lion rivalry is well documented. And let me once again introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, to the North Clan. Yeah, we are at the North Clan den, Normally a lot easier to find than lions. Lions move quite regularly. First few weeks or month or so that lioness might keep her cubs in a similar place. But it's not the same sorts of social dynamic that you find with hyenas. There we go. That one's got a stick. And this is where everything happens, where the youngsters learn how to behave, how the social hierarchy in hyena society works. Because what happens is you have a female-dominated society and her offspring inherit her rank. Every now and again, youngsters, or should I say females, can move up the ranks through aggression. And it's all about aggression and dominance and body language in hyena society. And whenever they do encounter each other, we might get some of it soon. There might be some greeting, the ceremonies that happen. 
Um, the hyenas will turn from head to tail and they'll show each other their genitals, which they'll allow each other to sniff. And as soon as another member joins from wherever they are off for the afternoon, we will see that happen between the cubs, between adults. And it's a very, very important part of their society to show one's most vulnerable parts. They're right next to the car, everybody. To show one's most vulnerable parts is a form of sort of acceptance, also submissive behavior. And if you don't show them, well, you could land yourself in a lot of trouble. But the youngsters pick up on all the smells that the parents bring back. But they've got to learn everything they can around the den site before they can go off hunting for their dinner. And we are very privileged to be able to spend as much time as we do with the hyenas of the Mara. And I did mention it last night about how much fun we do have it with the hyenas here because they are such characters and well david he loves lions i think more than hyenas and i think he is still with his cats down towards the west it's wonderful to know that hyenas got dense and sometimes it's always easy for us to know where to look for them and like lions like this which as I said earlier, this is one male that I have not seen and I would not know what coalition he comes from, but the female comes from a pride that we call the border pride or the old Ndonyo Pike. Boom, there he goes. Now two things have happened since I've been here for over an hour. Number one, the temperatures have gone down considerably and the wind, the pace of the wind has picked up. If you look through that red autograph, grass, you can see how it's being blown by the wind. Now, lions, regardless, you know, of whether it's hot or it's cold or it's windy or not, if they're mating, as I said, it's a very special ritual and that does not change. The pace, if they're starting and they're doing like 67 two times, you know, in a day, so the weather conditions do not affect the mating. But at the moment, I've seen a huge gap of them stay without mating, looking at the first four times, or rather, I would say I've counted four, yeah, four times since they have been mating, but now this has been a bit prolonged gap between the other time. Now, because the wind just blows and kind of like affects them, they have to be, you know, find out what kind of sound that is. That's why you see that female putting her head up once in a while. She looks very young to me, but I would say this male has been mating before. But I think now they have a little bit of a slip, which is fine after having been very active the last uh, couple of minutes. We'll find out if they're going to mate again because not anything else they're going to do. Let's take you back to Steve with the hyenas by the den. Well, <laughs> lions, as they sleep, our hyena cubs start getting active. They are very inquisitive what they can smell is beyond me they've got such incredible sense of smell that they must be able to pick up on all sorts of things well, there are two adults around the den at the moment one on the right or on the left there got a little notch in her ear oh she's now laid down of course she was just suckling that cub that's just come out of the den there i was licking her lips a moment ago she's just had a nice little bit of a drink and now it's her turn to come and say hello but there's another female just off to the right here who's lying quite flat and if we look closely you'll actually notice that there's a little bit of a collar on her neck and i alluded it to alluded to it last night that michigan state university has been doing research for three decades in the mara on hyena and that collar there is for research purposes it documents the movement and all sorts of things that they're calibrating for the research of the hyenas here in the Mara which in three decades is an enormous amount of information and Waffles was a very low-ranking female born to a low-ranking female and actually fought her way to the top and for most of last year and the year before we think she was actually in charge of this den she was actually the matriarch and then sometime towards the end of last year, earlier this year, she got displaced by her granddaughter. So she's still allowed to hang around, uh, but she doesn't have the same privileges that she had before. 
But now that we are at this den, the den sites are the hive of activity, and we are very fortunate to spend lots of time with them. The spotted hyena is one of the most versatile of Africa's carnivores. They are able to take advantage of a multitude of different habitat types. The landscapes of the Western Kruger and those of the Mara Serengeti are nothing alike, and so the hyenas of each area must occupy different homes. In the rich black soils of the Mara, the clans den in secret burrows beneath the long grasses. When the storms dump their life-giving loads, the tunnels, while safe from predators, can become inundated. In the western Kruger, termite mounds rise out of the sandy, granitic soils. Once invaded by Artfark, they are the perfect shelter for vulnerable hyena cubs. Hard as concrete and sheltered from the rain. In both locations, hyena mothers will move den from time to time, often as a result of crowding or unwanted attention from predators. Dominant mothers and cubs will monopolize any takeaway meals. No matter where you find them, hyena dens are unique havens of safety and hubs of social activity for one of Africa's most complicated carnivores. Our little cubs have now become three. The third one is just around the other side. We've changed angles slightly, hoping to get another perspective of what they're looking at. And one of them has also changed angles, so they're now looking both sides of their little termite mound. There's the third one. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that delightful? The three little ones wanted to join and their mother walked halfway and then stopped. And so they've stopped with her. They're not quite as brave as these three just yet. And there is their supper. I must say they don't look as full as I expected them to look. I'm pretty sure they must have eaten last night. But none of them are very rotund. They don't have those huge, big, round bellies that they get after a big meal. And at the end of this migration season, you won't believe how big and round their bellies will be. Now, these are not the only young cats in Africa that are looking for dinner. There's a little leopard quite a long way from here who's also looking for supper. The golden hour really is here, here in the Kruger Park in South Africa, and our leopardess is on the move. She's awake, she's alert, she's very, very much hungry from what we can see. So we are going to try and keep up with her, and hopefully we might get to see her catch her dinner. It's all live, it's all happening right here with CGTN Africa, and of course... She's known to just sneak through the bushes and just grab a scrub here. She's famous for it. Let me just see if I can see where she's gone. Yep, she's up here. You see her, Seb? There we go. You can just see her before I crash into other vehicles. Just making her way through the thicket, trying to remain unseen. Now, of course, as soon as antelopes or birds spot her, they start alarm calling. They start making loud barks and calls and noises to alert others in the area that a predator is around. And that's what she's trying to avoid. The more she remains unseen, I'm just going to edge forward a little bit, the more, well, the more chance she has of actually securing a meal. Right, here we go. She's right there. Uh oh, she's on the move again. Okay, I'm gonna go this way. Let's see if we can just get her going down here. There 
Here we go. She's just about to move behind that termite mound. No. Oh, she's actually going up the termite mound. That would be ideal. That would be a lovely position. See her tail twitching there? You can see her ears are up. Christy's asking, is she bigger than her mum? No, she's much smaller, much more petite. I think she's got quite a bit of filling out to do. She's obviously grown a lot since she was a cub, but of course, she, I think she's got a little bit more filling out to do. But most likely, she's not going to get any taller than this. And actually, she's currently being watched by a tawny eagle. Shall we show you the tawny eagle in the tree here? It's watching her very, very closely. <laughs> Just gonna move forward for Seb and then he'll get you a beautiful view of this tawny eagle, which has really good eyesight and is watching her. So we're gonna catch up with our leopardess and do the very best that we can. And while we do that, we're gonna send you guys back up to East Africa. Thanks, Lauren. Now I know you're thoroughly enjoying your time with the Princess Lalamba, but I know for a fact Lauren would switch places with me in a heartbeat to be here with the North Clan. Lauren has got an affinity for hyenas, and she spent quite a bit of time with them earlier this year. They are very special, although they've got a very, very bad reputation as being disproved time and time again. Everybody thinks of hyenas as these lowly scavengers that steal food from lions all the time, but the reality is hyenas actually have the ability to hunt very effectively in a clan style. And quite often when you find lions on a kill and hyenas around seemingly scavenging, it's the hyenas that have potentially made the kill and lions have moved in to steal it. That one has found itself a little bone that it doesn't want to share. Oh, it's got a teeth, got a set of teeth there. Now, there is no bigger scavenger than a male lion. He'll take advantage of absolutely any kill that happens, even from other lions. And so hyenas have got that bad rap when really they <laughs> do actually make a lot of their own kills. Um, the, the thing that they are capable of doing is breaking into the bones that other animals aren't able to do. So out here on the plains, all the carcasses that are left behind, picked clean by vultures, hyenas are able to eat at their leisure later in the season when times are a bit tough. With their very powerful jaws and strong teeth, they're able to access the bone marrow in bones that are unex... Un unex uh, what's the word? Um, other animals are unable to access. And they'll often bring some bones back to the den, like that set of teeth, uh, other bones as well. But generally, the matriarch is the one who brings things back for her daughters. Mr. Hyena, you say hyenas are incredible. They are indeed, and they are very cute as well as very naughty. Um, they've got to learn all of the tricks of the trade of being hyenas before they get to go out there and spend time in the land of lions and other hyenas. They need to know how to behave themselves. And all of those lessons are learned here at the den. There go. There's going to be a little bit of, of dominating, domination happening here. Those are my teeth. Lots of biting. Here we go. Has it dropped it? No. <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> uh, they are very, very cool animals indeed. And finding a den site is absolutely golden. How many do you count, John? A good seven, eight pups, eight cubs, sorry two adults. You might hear a few vehicles. They're on their way back to the hotel nearby. It's getting to that time of evening when the park is closing. And while we stay here with this naughty group of hyenas, let's send you back down to Lauren with the princess. She's 
She's still on the move, and you can see her tail is curled around there constantly. She hasn't changed its position, and she's not quite hunting yet, but she's actively in that mode. She's preparing to find whatever she can come across, and of course make a... Oh, she's, she's running, she's running really fast. There we go. Now she is heading towards a drainage line, which is not ideal for us to follow. And everywhere she goes, she does something called a Fleming grimace. And this is what mammals do to taste the environment, if you like. They pull back their top lip, expose their teeth. It goes something like, something like that. And what they're doing is inhaling the air to taste the pheromones all around. And they get an indication of who's been here, the scent, what's happened. And that's what she's been doing this whole time. She's most likely trying to find out if another leopard has actually been here, who, and if she can steal his food. She's notorious, I'm gonna go this way, for stealing her brother's food and he steals off of her. So they're very established hunters, but they love to steal from one another. Why hunt when you can steal from your brother, huh? So she's gone this way. Let's just see if we can keep up with her. She's really uh, made my day very exciting. Okie dokie, so we're gonna try and catch up with her. She's somewhere here. And while we do that, back up to James with his lioness. Just a magnificent afternoon of predator action here on CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. Live as it is from three locations in Africa, the Masai Mara in the Serengeti, the, sorry, the Masai Mara in Kenya. I got distracted by the little lion cub climbing up there. The Serengeti in Tanzania and the Western Kruger of South Africa. Now we have a brave little cub that's going to join her cousins, his cousins. You can see it's a little him. And they seem to be very tolerant of him climbing all over them. And he's saying to them, what are you guys looking at? Isn't that the cutest scene you've ever se seen? <laughs> the cutest scene you've ever seen? It is amazing when you watch cubs like this and you watch the hyena cubs, it's astonishing to think how they turn from these adorable creatures into the ferocious adults that they will become. That is what happens, and I suppose that's the same with just about all mammals. It's amazing how ferocious human beings can come, or can become. That's just delightful. Little cousins playing happily, watching supper walk by. And every so often the adults are getting up and looking around, thinking about how to pass the evening what they're going to be doing, just looking behind us, what they're going to be doing for hunting. And it's often something unsuspecting like this. Something's going on here. She looks like she's about to run. No, she's not. She settled down. We'll find out what she was looking at. Let's go back to the North Clan Den. Well, the action played off a little bit for a moment there. One of the smallest ones actually went and stole those teeth from one twice its size, which goes to show the dominance that is at play around the den site. If you are born to a higher ranking female, you have dominance over cubs two, three times your size. Redstone and Prime, you want to know why people call hyenas scavengers? Well, all predators, apart from cheetah really, are scavengers and will feed off of carcasses if they can, including human beings. That's where we started our meat eating. Um, but hyenas are often found feeding off of the remains of a kill. So they've got that bad reputation. And also the early sort of uh, observers, naturalists would have found lions feeding on something, missed the entire action that happened in the night and would have seen hyenas on the periphery trying to steal or claim back the kill. And all everybody would say is, oh, those mangy hyenas have tried to steal back from the lions. And in fact, it's probably the other way around. 
hyenas are very efficient hunters. They are stamina chasers. They run animals into the ground, uh, actually nipping at them and biting them as they go. The animals eventually fall down and die of blood loss and shock. Uh, they're not stalking specialists like lions or leopards. When they pick a weak individual out of the herd, they run it down. Um, and they're very good at doing that. They're very coordinated as well. But they will feed off of carcasses that are left behind, of course. Predators are opportunistic. And I think it's also the evolution of them being able to feed on bones that's given them that reputation of being only scavengers. But they probably make more kills than most people give them credit for. Go, trying to share those little teeth over there, it seems. Constantly sniffing the ground, trying to figure out all sorts of things. I'm surprised more adults haven't returned back for the, the daily suckle session. There's got to be a number of adults that are out somewhere, maybe just waiting for the coolness of the evening to set in before moving back from wherever they've been. Ooh, look at those teeth. Okay, well, well, while we stay here with these cuddly and cute hyenas, James is a little bit further south with the Salted Pride. Now the adults have climbed up onto the termite mound as well. They've displaced one of the older cubs, and they too are thinking about dinner as the light starts to fade. You may have noticed that the light is definitely fading. The sun hasn't gone down, but there's a huge pall of smoke that's moved in over the Olololo escarpment to the west of us, and it's really dimmed things down a bit. I don't think they're going to move off this termite mound, I'd say for another half an hour or so, maybe just before that. Just as twilight starts to fall, they'll start to ghost through these grasslands, through this thick, long grass on their way to the herds. And they'll see what they can catch for supper. Two little ones having a little game in the long grass. The wildebeest beyond, totally oblivious to their presence. And I think what the adults were looking at when last I saw you was in fact the other adults, the other side of the road. I can't see them, but that would have explained their reaction. Hear the canoeing. Linda, you say it's so precious. It is absolutely delightfully precious. It's also, I suppose, uh, uh, to me rather awe inspiring because they're just posing in the most perfect postcard way. Watching the wildebeest, those huge herds beyond, enjoying the view of what will hopefully become a meal for them sometime tonight. And for me, being in a place like this is a tremendously fulfilling experience. I suppose if I was to give you a one-word description of it, it would be fulfilling. I feel very fulfilled by watching these animals and the playing out of one of nature's greatest dramas. Isn't that wonderful? especially with all the sounds. And I'm just going to describe the smell to you quickly. It smells like rich grass. It's not quite dry because there's still a lot of green grass here. It's quite herbaceous. And there's a smell of smoke coming out of Tanzania. And it's just delightful on this breeze. Right, that's going to be it from this afternoon safari. Remember, tomorrow morning we're on from 7.30 Central African time. 7.30 Central African time. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your questions and your comments. It's been an absolute privilege bringing you these magnificent animals. Sorry, that's 6.30 Central African time. Until tomorrow, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night.